So I'm going to start with Jim Bajan. Uh, Jim is affiliated with the University of Michigan, where he's a professor in the departments of anesthesiology and the College of Engineering and director of the Center for Healthcare Engineering and Patient Safety. Um, he has a long list of previous accomplishments and positions, which include uh, being an Air Force flight surgeon, a NASA astronaut, and chief patient safety officer at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Welcome, Jim. Uh, Summer Gentry, immediately to my left, is um, at the University of, at the U, excuse me, the U.S. Naval Academy, where she is a professor in mathematics. She's also affiliated and on the faculty at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, Summer's work focuses on organ transplantation and ways to use uh, operations research to improve access. Um, and uh, we're, she's a, a very well-recognized expert in that area, and we're, we're happy to have her here. At the far end, uh, Eva Lee is a distinguished member of the faculty of Georgia Tech's uh, School of Industrial and Sin Systems Engineering. She's worked with many of our leading medical centers on challenging problems in health systems improvement and biomedicine. Uh, won several awards for work in that area. And, uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, Julie Swan um, is a professor at North Carolina State University and also head of the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering there. Uh, Julie is a research leader on methods for making supply chains and health systems more efficient, effective, and equitable. So welcome to all of you. Uh, the format for the panel will be, uh, I've asked each of our panelists to make about 10 minutes of informal remarks. You'll notice we don't have any slides, so we're out of our comfort zone in terms of our <laughs> usual method for talking to people. Hopefully that will facilitate communication and won't cramp our, our panelist style. Uh, and then we, uh, we will open things up for questions afterward. So sh we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Let me start immediately to my left. I think we'll just go down the panel, and so I'm going to start with Summer. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, so a little bit about the kinds of problems I've been engaged with. I started working in organ transplantation because my constant collaborator and my husband is a transplant surgeon. He brought the first uh, OR problem in transplantation to me, and that was how can we arrange kidney exchanges so that the largest number of people can benefit? So if uh, someone wants to be a donor to a loved one, in about a third of the cases they find that they're incompatible with that person that they wanted to donate to. And before we started working in this area, that th those donors would generally be sent home. I'm sorry, you can't donate. But now we arrange exchanges so that another family who has an incompatible donor and a recipient, maybe their donor can donate to your loved one and you can donate to their loved one and you uh, circumvent this incompatibility. And the problem we attacked was if you had a large number of families with these incompatible donors, how, which people should be matched together so that the largest number of people can benefit. So this is a classical maximum cardinality matching problem on a graph. And of course, it immediately became more complicated when you started talking about three-way exchanges. And then you have non-directed donors, someone who says, I'll just donate to anyone. How can you make the best use of, of gifts like that? and um, really had a fantastic run of research in this area, but we immediately had a problem with regulation, with government policy, because the National Organ Transplant Act in the 80s said you can't give an organ for valuable consideration. And the intent was to prevent people from selling organs, or I'll give you an organ and you give me a job, but if you say, I'll give you my A blood type kidney so that you will give me your B blood type kidney, is that an exchange of valuable goods? And, and it, there was uncertainty around even doing this, and that prevented the organ procurement and transplantation network from setting up a national registry to do these exchanges. Of course, initially there had been some research in the field that's, that came to bad conclusions that only this would only affect a few people. In fact, we found that half of the people who had incompatible donors could easily find a match in an exchange and that that would mean thousands of additional transplants per year. These were all simulation models because we didn't have any real data on incompatible pairs. So we're immediately we're using simulation and optimization, some key tools within the operations research toolkit 
to make the case to Congress that they ought to change this law so that more people can get a kidney transplant. Um, and that was successful, and the Charlie Norwood Act clarified that kidney paired donation was never intended to be banned and that it was legal. And from then on, we started working with the United States, with Canada, to sort of give them our algorithms, give them our software to make matches. And now that's been the biggest increase in living kidney donation that the country has ever seen. We've got at least 2,000 people who received a kidney transplant to date that wouldn't have had one without that change in the law, without that registry and those algorithms. So that's really exciting. And another cool thing is that it's also been a growth area within operations research. There are a ton of people working on specialized algorithms for particular variants of these kidney exchange matching problems. So it's a great example of solving a real problem and also stimulating you know, academic innovation. And so since that, since that time, I've been working on another problem, which is an equity problem within organ transplant. I've been working on liver allocation. Livers are given to the person who's the sickest, the person who's at the most risk of dying if they don't immediately receive a transplant. And so the point of allocation is to prevent, you know, prevent deaths on the wait list. However, right now, liver allocation happens within these 52 donor service areas and 11 regions that were created for historical reasons, not created for equity. And you have sources of rich sources of organs that are isolated from heavy areas of need by these regional lines. Well, so the, the classic operations research approach to this problem is redistricting. We should redraw those lines so that we have region boundaries in places that balance supply and demand in each of those areas. So we proposed changing the 11 regions into these eight optimized districts. This idea was really transformative within the transplantation community because the, the geographic inequity has been a real sticking point and it's been very hard to address this problem because there are people's financial and, and prestige interests at stake. If my hospital does fewer transplants, maybe I can't hire another physician, maybe, you know, maybe my hospital isn't seen in such a good light when we don't have the highest number of transplants in our area. Um, and so it's really been impossible to break through the stalemate on fixing geographic inequity. But it was amazing how much we got the problem to move by saying, instead of it's just um, ad hoc guesses about how to fix geographic disparity, we asked the liver transplant committee to tell us what are the characteristics that describe a feasibly small region? How, you know, how many hours of transport time are allowed? How many hospitals have to be there? What's the minimum number of donors that have to be there? Write all those down as constraints. And then tell us what is the measure of geographic equity that you want us to optimize. So that instead of arguing about what system it would be moving forward, it was just, can we agree that we would like this system to be equitable or not? And I, I really liked the way that sort of forced the transplant community to clarify what is the problem that they want to solve and, and what would it look like if, it, if you had a better solution. And the fact that we created a, a method that would have made allocation a lot more equitable actually ended up being very transformative. Well, because there was a lawsuit recently that changed lung allocation. And the lawsuit said that lungs were being distributed unfairly and one of their pieces of evidence was some of our papers that we had, we had written showing there is a better way to do this. Um, so so that, those are the kind of things that I've been involved in and I'm really looking forward to discussing that more with you. Thank you, Summer. Jim. Well, following up on um, what Summer said and, and what we heard from the two addresses earlier today, or actually more than two, but the, uh, the whole issue of, you know, uh, as Laura said earlier, you know, saving lives, saving costs, uh, solving problems, I think, is right on what we're talking about here. To put in context, if you just look from a financial standpoint, right, in the, uh, in the U.S., we spend 18% of the GNP on health care, which is double what the average of first world countries does. You know, if we look at the, the quality of the health care, that is, the overall benefit to societies in general, not for individuals, we're about in the middle of the road. So if you want to look at it from a value standpoint, 
we're not getting the bang for the buck. So you can look at it as inefficient use of resources, uh, a bunch of different ways to look at it. But obviously, it's kind of a zero-sum game. There's only so much money out there. And if you're flushing half of it down the toilet and not getting the results you want for the population as a result, that's not a good thing. Uh, in a more maybe uh, stark way to look at it, besides just the money, because you can you know, equate in some way uh, lives to money, which I think you have to at some point. Uh, if you look in the United States, probably the best data that exists, and it's not different, much different from other first world countries, about 25, 27 percent of everybody that's admitted to a hospital ends up being harmed just because they spent a night in the inn. So just because you happen to be in the hospital, you have about a one in four chance of being harmed, half of those being permanently disabled just because you were there, and about one and a half percent end up dead. So that's not really good. If you look at quality in most places, you know, mo no other industry could, could continue <coughs> to exist with that you know, poor of an outcome as far as their, their clients, if you want to look at it that way. So uh, the question is, well, how does that come to OR, and what do you look there? I mean, part of this is, you know, how do you allocate your resources, your you know, limited resources? How do you look at problem solving? Um, we looked at you know, a number of things, like what's the best value? And we looked at things from how do you use the information? There's a lot of data. We heard there's a lot of data, and the, you know, people have been saying for years, well, how do you turn it into usable information? Um, some of the things you can look at and, and we've looked at is, for instance, with uh, there's information that exists. If you look at medical records, you have the written medical records or electronic medical records, which I think um, are justifiably criticized because many weren't really well designed for the, with the user in mind. But they have both information that people take as histories, you know, what they write down or type in. There's lab data that's more objective <coughs> data, study data. And then you have, when they're being treated, actual physiologic data. You know, the squiggly lines you see on the screen that are blood pressure or heart rate or, or their ECG trace, whatever. Uh, and how do you integrate all that data in a way that doesn't just give you, just, you know, reduce the squiggly lines to digits, you know, on a, on a screen, but actually gives you something you can use. And for instance, at Michigan, you know, and now it's in a number of other uh, institutions around the country, we integrated all those, looked at the data, marry it with what's known to actually give the the practitioner at, at the point of care, direct information about here's a problem, not just you know the numbers out of limit, but here's what you ought to do. And we've shown that you know we've we've reduced bed days of care, which is direct cost. So if you want to say that cost that we you could argue we waste half of it in the United States that's not efficiently used, we're saving that cost, which is available either to turn that money back to the people, maybe not, but you know turn that money back or make it used to take care of people more thoroughly than we do right now as well as reduce you know, mortality by the same token. By applying some of these same uh, type um, uh, means, you can use that in many other ways. So that's one thing. We looked at things that you talk about. Transplant was a very interesting one. Uh, I chaired the uh, ACGME uh, CLEAR Committee, which was how do we look at resident education, people are training to be physicians, and how do we make sure where they train they see what you'd like them to model in the future, and usually you don't. I mean, medicine's a cottage industry. It's a guild system. It's not really governed in a, in a big way. It's trying to be. It's moving forward, but it's not quite there. And we heard talk earlier today about the tribes and all. And medicines is much one of the tribes, as you see, of anything where probably with operations research, traditionally more has been, not a lot, and Don and I were talking earlier, in finance. But as far as care, it's almost not talked about. I mean, you're seeing people here talking about it. It's not in the mainstream, I think, mostly people would agree. In fact, I think it's unfortunate we taught OR, operations research. In medicine, they think you're talking about the operating room. So you always say, no, we're not talking about the operating room. Yeah, you can argue the merits of operations research as a term, but OR is a non-starter in healthcare. That's right. You've got to talk about something yeah. else or there's confusion <laughs> right, off, you know, right from the get-go. But uh, we had in the beginning, <coughs> one of the things they talked about was uh, how, how long residents will spend training, you know, how much they can work a week. And it was limited some years ago to 80 hours a week. And it's gamed, and there's many things that happen there. But I think it has improved things because we do know fatigue can play a role. Well, in the transplant area, they said, well, we think this is uh, disturbing our ability to have residents and fellows available to do transplants as well as to educate them. And we were finding in some of the large programs where <coughs> transplant surgeons would be trained usually for kidney, lung, liver, and heart, and they would want to finish that fellowship having had experience. We were finding less than a quarter would actually get experience in all four of those areas to be competent. So they were forced to, in a de facto way, say, well, do you want to be mainly a kidney transplant surgeon? So we'll make sure you get enough kidneys, but you're not going to get the others. Well, sometimes that's okay, but it was less than optimal. And the thought, which wasn't true, but the thought was, oh, it's because of the 80 hours. If we let them work 120 hours, we could do it all, right? And they, they lived in this, 
you know, some of the, the more senior surgeons, and not just the most more senior, said, well, back in the old days, you know, if you just could work them more, they would get it done in so many months. And we said, well, is that really true? So we went and looked at the data and said, okay, how many people get referred? How many surgeons? How do we do call schedules? Things like that. And we found out, and we even set up a little simulator. They could just move the dials, like how many cases come in, how many fellows are here. And we showed that we could get way up over half by just changing how the call schedule ran. Nothing else. You know, they had a very simplistic every third day. Well, the patients don't come in every third day. It's like a kidney this time, next time you know, you get a liver. It wasn't like that. I said, oh, well, you could change it because they're taking a call from home. They're sleeping anyway. If you need a kidney, well, let, let that person come in for a kidney. Oh, what an idea. You know, I mean, there's things you could do to show with, with virtually no <coughs> economic impact, you could get far greater yield in how people were trained and who you could service. So there's many things you can do in that way. And uh, there's a host of examples, access for patients. You know, how do you get patients in? We have at Michigan, we have people coming from the Upper Peninsula, which is like a seven hour drive away, or even up to 10 hours if you're way on the west side of the Upper Peninsula, and they're coming down for chemotherapy. Well, they have to travel the day before, and then they get there, well, if they're sick, do they cancel their thing? Or making up the chemotherapeutic agent beforehand, it costs on the average $1,700 per treatment, just for the drugs. Well, we'd waste it, so what's wasted? Do you want to waste? When do you do it? How do you schedule those? And we found there's ways to look at that using OR, not operating room, but operation resource management, how do we use that to actually come up with scenarios where we can treat more patients, make them wait less, waste less reagent or less drug, so that's cost, the cost yeah. is cut down. So by applying different things like this, you can get around some of the previously held, and I would say it's because the mom and pop mentality of the guild, you know, when you only were the doc on the corner, you could probably figure out with common sense how to do things. It's far more complex than that. No person can have in their head all the different influences that impact how a patient gets cared for, how we make use of resources effectively and efficiently. So by using OR, you're able to actually demonstrate with the facts to the physicians, and not just physicians, administrators and others, how you can actually get to the goal, and I think it's very important in communication, what the goal is, the best care for the patient, and, and not just one patient, but all our patients. You know, you have to recognize there's a population you're treating, and if you can show with actual quantitative data how to do it, and then you test it through implementation, you can show there are ways to do this that aren't intuitively obvious, and change is difficult for anybody <coughs> to change the way they always did it that actually give a better result. Thanks, Jim. Julie. Thank you, Don. I want to talk a little bit um, generally about what areas of health OR can contribute to before I give specific examples. So a lot of times it starts with a problem that someone has um, or a question that someone has. And that problem can be, uh, you know, in the case of the, the residents, it can be at the hospital level, it can be at the clinician level, it could be at the level of a state health agency, you know, how do I serve my population most effectively to reach patients with pediatric asthma? It can be at the level of a federal agency, what do we do in the case of infectious disease outbreak? Um, it can be at the level of policy. Uh, Summer gave some examples there, and there are others uh, around um, uh, what might be covered by insurance, and, and others even in the case of policies driven in, in insurance companies. So all of those areas have problems that, that OR folks can work on. And so then what you need is a matching between someone who has a problem and someone who has some set of techniques and uh, to be able to look at that in a fresh way. And so that often involves a dialogue. In 2007, we wanted to deepen our impact in the health and humanitarian communities. So we, we started going around and asking, what are the things that keep you up at night? What kinds of challenges do you expect to have over the next two years or five years? And we found several that we identified that we were able to work on over a longer period of time. But it's really important to have that input from stakeholders and decision makers across many different spectrums in the healthcare space. Decisions or problems uh, of interest could be at the strategic level, the tactical level, the operational level, and, and OR can contribute to all of those. I made a partial list of, of agencies who, who might have interest in using OR in healthcare. So there definitely are state agencies, including Medicaid, uh, the, the ones that deal with that, along with the ones that deal with public health. On the federal side, uh, the groups that deal with Medicare, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You've got the Veterans Administration and all of the things around care for veterans, not only through the Veterans Administration, but through TRICARE as well. 
Uh, there's the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which has a lot of work um, either with ongoing OR projects or potential ones. Uh, Department of Health and uh, Human Services, NIH, and, and there are many others. And so I know that, that many of you come from, from those organizations and others representing Congress. And there are clearly problems uh, in healthcare that affect decisions that are made in all of those different environments. Many of us work with data. So what kinds of data might you work with if you're working on OR problems in the healthcare space? Certainly it could be health records, uh, like what Jim mentioned. Uh, Summer was talking about unique data sets from the organ transplant world. It could be claims data from Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance companies. It can be data that's generated within hospitals. It can be surveillance data about infectious outbreaks. It can be economic data, population data, and many other kinds. So I want now to talk a little bit about a couple of examples of work that we did and, and how those aro arose in the context of the stakeholders and decision makers. So one was with the CDC, and when we went back in 2007 and said, what are these challenges that are, that are keeping you awake at night? And um, one of the answers was influenza pandemic. And this was in advance of the 2009 outbreak, but it certainly was well known. Experts were predicting that a major pandemic would hit US and globally. And this was, they were making plans well in advance of, uh, of when this would occur around what they would do with vaccine, which might be in limited supply, what might be done with other kinds of medical countermeasures, antivirals, personal protective equipment, other kinds of things. We were also hearing about fears of pandemic from nonprofit organizations who were also doing planning on the food distribution side. So we started working with collaborators in this space and, and really looking at, well, what would an influenza pandemic mean for all of the communities and cities and counties in some geographical space? And we had already built up a number of models and research papers, and then 2009, the H1N1 pandemic did hit. And I, I started hearing reports of it coming from Mexico back in the spring. And then, of course, the, the ramp up uh, became much, much bigger over the, the course of the, of the months. Uh, several of us were on loan to the Centers for D Disease Control at that time as science advisors to assist with some of the decision making on the distribution side and, and policy side. And even now we continue to work in this space because uh, even though H H1N1 2009 has passed, it continues to be of uh, great risk, both to the US and, and globally, both influenza outbreaks as well as other kinds of diseases. Certainly Ebola has come back up now recently and, and there are many others. And many healthcare experts say that infectious disease outbreaks are one of the, uh, the things that really uh, you know, makes them have sleepless nights uh, worrying about what will happen because we have such a global interconnected world. Well, what can OR do for those kinds of problems? We can uh, look at certainly uh, around the distribution and logistics of uh, getting vaccine to places quickly, uh, equitably across both urban and rural areas. Uh, we've done things like look at what is the impact of school closures uh, during an outbreak. And, and one thing that we found is that it, it can be very disruptive, of course. You've got to have parents who can stay at home with the, the children. But then you also have the children continuing to mix with each other because they're not going to be sitting in their rooms at, at home, right? And so um, school closures can actually lead to an increase in cases if uh, people are mixing and, and uh, infecting each other during that time period. So that's one story that came about because of those discussions with the CDC. Another project that we've worked extensively on is around pediatric asthma. And um, there are some well-known interventions for asthma, such as self-management education to, to teach children about using uh, their medications reliably and these kinds of things. Well, and we had been looking at data from the Medicaid claims system for some time, but we were also asked to work with the CDC on developing a return on investment analysis that would assist states in their decision making. So not only an, an analysis that turned into a paper, but they were also asking for a tool that could be distributed to state Medicaid and public health organizations to not only help them see what the impact would be of putting in place interventions, but also estimating that cost over a relatively short period of time. A, a three-year time period was what we used as the, the maximum timeline. And so you can see what the impacts of the cost would be to the state, 
the providers. Uh, you can see what the impacts are on the patients, you know, saving lives, saving money, solving problems. All of those are in this, uh, this collaboration that I'm describing where we were working with both state agencies and federal programs. And so that one, um, it, it's a relatively newer project, and so the tools uh, being uh, going through CDC clearance uh, before it is distributed widely, but it has been tested and used by a number of states. So one other example that I want to give, which is um, a more unusual example, and it is not one I expect anyone in the room to have, but we asked the Carter Center what was keeping them awake at night, and they said, dogs in Chad. Now, what do dogs in Chad have to do with somebody from an engineering background? I ask you, and, and you know, they also asked uh, us what it might have to do, <laughs> right? And, um, but what, what we have uh, found, they're trying to eradicate guinea worm, and they realized that something new was happening that they had not seen before. And more than 1,000 dogs in Chad were being infected by guinea worm, and then it was turning into a cycle where it reinfected humans, and it was really causing major problems for the push to eradicate guinea worm. Mm -hmm. So why do I tell you this story? I tell you because you can have problems that are unexpected ones, where you don't even know that operations research could, could provide assistance on it. But it's something that's it's pressing, it's important, and um, there is something that science and, and evidence uh, work can bring to bear on these problems, even when they don't seem necessarily like they are engineering problems. And I want to touch just briefly on what OR and healthcare might be doing in the future, just a, a couple elements. Certainly, cost is going to continue to be a focus, reducing costs wherever possible. And not just at the hospital level, but really across the system, doing so while still enabling access to care, even for people in rural communities, which may, may be doing things like um, using increased use of telemedicine or other technologies that can reach people while st still keeping costs relatively low. I think that there's going to continue to be work on access to the right kind of care for uh, and the right location for the people who need it. And I think um, over the, the next 10 years, we'll see an increase in personalized precision medicine, where we will see that pharmaceuticals and treatments can be directed towards the people who will, and it can be directed based on your profile, your DNA, your bacteria, so that it will have greater impact. And evidence-based decision-making with data and OR tools can really assist in that as well. Thanks, Julie. Last but certainly not least, Eva. Thank you. So I think this is a very nice uh, description. I, um, I think the, uh, just to give you an idea, I will give you a, a little bit maybe different aspect. So I am uh, directing the Center for Operations Research in Medicine and Healthcare. I'm also uh, co-directing the Center for Health Organization Transformation. So the first, I think all the projects that are described are perfect because it kind of segue into exactly some of the work in the medical care um, arena that we are doing using uh, OR in the how do you do early detection. Early detection in many different forms, for example, brain tumor, cancer, you look at epigenetics. So we are looking at data that is really the genomic data and data that may not be readily available, but they are complex and they can, you can start looking at those. And why is it so important? Because by the time we look at the cancer cells, if it actually exists like pancreatic cancer or brain tumor, that is already too late. So we will have to look at the changes in the body to identify that, so the early diagnosis. How do you diagnose Alzheimer's disease, cognitive, and autism? So some of these are really very dear to me because my first project, when I was started in healthcare 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, is that I really wanted to get into Alzheimer's. And I don't know why I wanted to, to get into that, but the answer at that time is there was no data for you to even figure out how do you identify that. Now the data is ready. Are we ready as an OR person? So I think that's really important in terms of early diagnosis. Chronic disease. The diagnosis is no longer, the data does not reside only in the hospital, but they are in the social media, they are in the environment, they are everywhere. Are we ready to do those type of data? And now we're not talking about true data or not. So these data may not be facts, but they do affect how people live, right? The behavioral part and chronic disease. So that's a big part of it that we like to do the early diagnosis, especially mental illness and autism and Alzheimer's. 
And then there's the personalized medicine, and I really love that Julie actually mentioned about personalized medicine, and that's really um, a big area that I'm focusing on, is how do you actually utilize the data? When to treat, how to treat, what to treat, and what evidence are we use? to actually come up with the plan for the individual patient. And I think we have quite a bit of successes in the cancer case where we actually use the data of the patient, biological data, translated and basically designed treatment plans for the patient to use. And it is really interesting if you look at OR, so I, I am the optimistic group, I said, I think OR is great that uh, has the same <laughs> word as operating room because I think the, um, my first project exactly is on cancer and it is in the operating room. The doctor would not talk to me about what I do. They just want me to go to the OR and say, look at what we do. I say, okay. I say, I feel comfortable with OR, so I will come. And, and it was on prostate cancer. And at the end, he asked me, what do you think? I said, amazing. Every single step was almost designed to fail. But it works, <laughs> right? I mean, but, but then it asked me, can you do it, make it better? I said, absolutely, we can do it better. And of course, I told them, let's do it in real time. I mean, that's what treatment for the process. And they looked at me, they thought I was crazy. But they say, that's not a chance. You can do it in real time. And that was the prostate cancer. That's my first project. And it took us six years to, like, so basically the doctor saw the plan. They were screaming down in the basement. I say, is it good or bad? They say, actually, it was so good that they couldn't believe it. They implemented it. Six years later, it became a standard. So I think, I think it is really interesting, right? It is how much we can actually do when we actually work with them, even though a lot of things we may not know. So that's, the, that's about the uh, prostate cancer. Another one is about the um, heart disease that we work with the children. Uh, like the um, pediatric heart network. And it is really wonderful is that we <laughs> identify lots of places to improve. And it is really hard to convince them. In fact, the site that the doctor, he was like the best surgeon. We talked to him and he was really, really nice to us. He said, oh, we respect your profession. We love the work, but it is not going to work. I said, okay, Dr. Oi, as it just like, you know, give us a chance and, and we will show you how it works in other site. And now, Michigan, actually, that's Michigan uh, Medical School, they actually got the best improvement. I mean, they were the one that was able to really save a lot of the little babies and, and reduce the length of stay and, and really about uh, changing the lives of these little babies. Because you're not talking about money anymore. These babies, if they don't get the right surgery at the right time, and that will affect their cognitive. And we reduce also the medication, which is the opioid type medication by 40%. And you're talking about the whole life of this baby is changed. And I think it is really exciting. I think the, uh, and, and, and then of course, the, the interesting thing about the public health, I think Julie is perfect also to talk about this CDC because we are at, at, uh, in Atlanta. So we have the advantage of working with CDC. And I remember when they first came to us and we have to test how hard the problem is. And, and I told the CDC <coughs> colleague, is it a hard problem? Is it an easy problem? If it's easy, okay, we will do it and forget about that, right? And, and so we actually stay up all night, uh, December 24th, like Christmas Eve, and testing the idea how hard it is to actually do the mass dispensing and do the resource allocation, do the disease propagation, and try to really do a containment and all of this. And we run it on, I think, 300 computers. That's in uh, 2003. And after one whole night, 16 hours later, we did not get any solution. I said, OK, you got the deal. <laughs> we are part of it. So it is really quite exciting. So I was in Japan for the Fukushima disaster and really working with, uh, alongside with some of the military personnel and hospital uh, leaders. So I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity for OR. And I will see it is beyond the operational side. And it is also about change management. So as I mentioned, one of the center that we talk about is transformation. It's not so much that we can say, look, we got better tools. And how are you going to adopt that? Right? Because one hospital may be able to adopt it, and the other may not be able to. So how can you make the change happen and that it is successful? And I think that's really important. So with the pediatric case, it was really a testimony in, in terms of like, how can they actually all learn at the same time? 
and learning in a different way, but all are successful. And I think that is really what we will see in the next generation of OR is that not only we work with individual hospitals, but also how do we actually spread it across so that they can all adopt the success and in a different way, but all in good outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, everyone. Um, some great remarks. Let me kick off the discussion before I turn it to our, to our audience members with um, a question, uh, and I'm going to go a little bit, take a step back, a little bit back to basics about just what we really mean when we talk about operations research. And by way of background, I spent several decades working with hospital IT and finance people, selling them software, and so I spent a lot of time sort of paying attention to what they got excited about. And about eight or ten years, I thought it was kind of cool they started talking about analytics, but healthcare being healthcare, they weren't quite working as fast as some other industries that our field has been used in. And so when you sort of dug down into what they meant by analytics, they usually were talking about things like dashboards and data visualization. Four or five years ago, all of a sudden, they started looking at predictive analytics as sort of a pinnacle level of analytics in a healthcare organization, that if we could actually predict things, we could do much better. Um, which I couldn't argue with that, but having said that, um, you know, so in, in the last year or two, there's been a huge amount of buzz around artificial intelligence and machine learning as particular flavors of predictive analytics. So let me just turn to you. The basic question I want to ask is, is operations research just another word for the same thing, or are we talking about something different? And can you say what that different thing is? You know, how is this, if we're talking to healthcare people, how is this different from what we're hearing about now when IBM or Google's <coughs> Alphabet parent starts talking about using artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare? Where, where's the added value in operations research? I'll take part of that sure. one. So um, at its base level, I think of artificial intelligence and machine learning as being computer algorithms, right? And essentially what they are doing is taking bits of data and generating some kind of information from that. But they are less focused on the decision side of things. And for me, what's really important about OR is that it also focuses on decisions and helping to show which decisions might be better or worse, and even provide guidance on what space of decisions might be best for a given problem. OR can also use the predictive elements that are in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other kinds of algorithms, and, and use it to generate what-if scenarios, you know, and, and mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But I think that that decision part is, is part of that added value. Anybody have anything? I, I wanted to echo yeah. exactly what you're saying that operations research being focused on making a decision with this information rather than on making a prediction or evaluating what has happened in the past really reverses some bad decisions that could be made based on prediction uh, analytics. Because we saw in kidney allocation that when they started promulgating this score called the kidney donor risk index, where they put every don uh, deceased donor kidney on a scale from 1 to 100, all the kidneys above number 85 started to be discarded. And we actually had lower utilization of kidneys, even though from the perspective of consider your two alternatives of take this kidney with a high D donor risk index or don't get a transplant, the patients were much worse off continuing to suffer on dialysis. And so th these were just poor decisions driven by you know the the here, let's statistically score everything and make sure you have a dashboard that's going to lead you to exactly the The score the wrong doesn't tell decision. you what the best action is based on the Precisely. score. And I, I would like to add that <coughs> I, I think what Laura said this morning, uh, really sum it up, is that operations research really look at the global thing. I won't discard artificial intelligence and machine learning. In fact, I actually incorporate that within my model. And I think it is the systems and the performance that we are looking at. It is really end-to-end -end in a sense. I know the general didn't think about end-to-end, -end, but for life and death, for in the hospital, you really do think about end-to-end, -end, right? The patient come in, and at the end, you want them to really recover and get good treatment and in every single step. And I think, I think OR gives you the global perspective. And also, it allows you to incorporate all the type 
different type of technology in it, and I think that is really the beauty. One more question for me, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, for the last decade or so, healthcare has been chasing a vision of big data, sort of like a dog chasing a car. So the, the efforts to get into electronic health records and do something with it and so on being sort of one highly visible feature of that. So I have a two-part question. One is, has the dog caught the car yet? And the other question is, once we do catch the car, if and when we catch the car, what are we going to do with it? So what, what's the payoff from, you know, have we arrived at big data yet? And what's the potential payoff from that that will make it easier, better, more effective, both for the healthcare system, but also for the kind of analyses we can do with that data? Any thoughts about that? When you go into an organization, Jim, do you have all the data you want and need sort of sitting there in a big well, data the warehouse? Well, no, right? Right. So. <laughs> it's a rhetorical, yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course it's not. The, uh, I, think one of the, I think there's a lot of issues, right? I mean, one is uh, that much, some of the data we have isn't even able to be used. I mean, or I, I shouldn't say that. It is not readily able to be used. Can you give uh, us an example? Well, a, a lot of the data, for instance, uh, you know, you, if you read a lot in the, in the medical literature, uh, you'll see that the physicians normally are always decrying the fact there's an electronic medical record as if it's the worst thing that ever happened uh, in productivity. And, and really, it's, it was poor implementation you know, from HHS, meaningful use, or I call it meaningless use, you know, came out. And I was on the IOM panel, looked at that, and there was a number of things that were, you know, they didn't talk about interoperability, probably interoperability, which is probably the single most important thing, mm -hmm. wasn't even part of it until a year ago. So that was one issue. So for people even to get data, you know, they're in their little silos. I so think th the translation interoperability is the ability to move data from one healthcare organization right. to another, and, and independent of what vendor you're Right, and, and, that and well, not just that, but if you're a patient and I yeah. care for at Johns Hopkins, and then I move to Michigan, I go to Michigan, well, good luck. I mean, that stuff in Johns Hopkins at least as locked up as it was before right. when they were working with patient uh, paper records or even worse. Right. So, and that's not, that's just an example. I'm not saying it's because of Johns Hopkins or University of Michigan, but I mean, the fact is it's the Tower of Babel. Uh, I think deliberately so in some cases. I think the other issue is that now because, for instance, of cut and paste, you hear it talked about a lot, and for the way they reward people you know, in their payments, people add way more to the medical record because they want the bean counters to be able to say, do I get paid? And it doesn't add to the care, and it actually ends up like camouflage what's done. There's many things that are pasted that they never did, that you know, they, you know, it's a huge issue, an ethical issue, where people cut and paste other people's remarks from before and bring it forward as if it's their own. Right. And uh, it ends up that it makes it very difficult for physicians, for example, to be able to review a record and know what happened. You have what used to be maybe a 15-page, and now it's a 60-page. Well, I guarantee you nobody's reading that 60 pages. You know, so that data is there. So, I mean, you look at it, oh, is it there? Yeah, is anybody can find it? Not really. So, mm. And you mean 60 pages of free text. Free right. text, that's yeah. correct. <laughs> so it's very difficult to look at. Right. And then even when you get to even lab data, the way it's you know, displayed, some is displayed in a way that the practitioner can readily use and some it's inscrutable. And that's why when I mentioned, for instance, we use for in the intensive care units in the OR, the op oh, operating room, or if we were in Britain, we'd say operating theater, so there wouldn't be that confusion. <laughs> but you know, if, um, if you make that available, that way it sifts through it in some way, but there's still a huge issue, I would say, with the free text, for example, to how do you really mine that? How do you find out what's real and what's not? And utilize that because, going back to Osler, I think it was, in the late 1890s, you know, the, the, you know, as a new physician, when you come out, people are often uh, enamored of the fact that, oh, I have a stethoscope, I have a reflex hammer and these things, and you think that's going to make a difference, and you don't really need that stuff most of the time. That's to confirm what the patient tells you. Most patients, if you do a, a well, well thought out history, they will tell you what's wrong, and the physical diagnosis is just confirmatory in most cases, I mean, the vast majority, and now we're getting to the point where the data that we would normally use to read notes, we can't even read it well in many cases. It doesn't have to be that way, and all mm -hmm. records are there, but the majority are, and I think, you know, or how do we mine that data? How do we look at the data and, and you know, kind of get the wheat from the shaft, so to speak? And I think it's a big challenge. I think, I think ultimately when we, and I think we will, make better use of it, it will be better for everybody. But right now, uh, I wouldn't say in some ways we've advanced, and I'm a big proponent of a good electronic medical record, but there are a few of those around. Well, we're better off than when there were manila folders stored in a <laughs> big room in the basement, right? But how much better off some, we are is In debatable. some areas, yeah, yeah, in some areas. You know, I think we are, in general, I think we're better. Yeah. And I'm a big proponent yeah. of it. But there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. I think OR can help a right. lot. Yeah. So you asked, so. What, what will we do when we catch the car? I think it's yeah. really important if we want to have 
the healthcare community on our side that we're not, what we do when we catch the car is we punish physicians for their outcomes, we punish you know, organizations when they're not compliant. Instead, we want to be on their side and helping mm -hmm. them make better decisions because I do think that's part of the hostility to the electronic medical record is that transplantation is one of the most heavily regulated areas in, in um, healthcare because the data are available. Once, as soon as the numbers are there, you're in trouble for, your, for, for everything that you've done. And, and it's making physicians more cautious about the decisions that they make. They're turning down organs. The organs are getting thrown in the trash. It's bad outcomes for everyone because it's turning into a punitive sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, I could just jump to that. I think I mean, yeah. that's a really important point because uh, and there was a good article in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago about use of data. Mm -hmm. And some data should be used for individuals as they're critiquing what goes mm -hmm. on and how do we do it. But to use it to compare one to another to rate this physician or this hospital mm -hmm. did a good job and this doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's an inappropriate use of the data and it mm -hmm. ends up driving things underground. I mean, in safety, that was a big thing that was in our aviation several decades ago. And when we started the safety thing when I was VA, we would never let a safety report ever be used against an individual, with very small exceptions. I mean, it would just be absolutely sequestered, as it is in aviation. That was a huge difference, and even still in healthcare, mm -hmm. most do not keep their safety data separate from the quality data. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people don't report. So people believe that reports tell you what's going on, and really all you have is incidents and prevalence of reporting, not of the real world. And I think mm -hmm. you have to really think ahead of time, just because data is there, who should use it, for what purpose it should be used for, and you should almost think, I not almost, I believe you should think about it before you start collecting data, you say, how am I going to use it? Because if you mm -hmm. don't think about that, it can have really uh, tremendous negative effects that drives things underground. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, all this is is a tool to make sure the patients get better care. So mm -hmm. if you think about it as a system, I think that OR can tie together, that if you're using it to castigate an individual or a, a, a profession or a discipline or a health system, well, why are they going to play with that? They're not. You know, they start gaming it, you get the data you want. I mean, we had just across the street here, early on, right after the Earth's Human Care, I was the medical representative at the hearing, and our inspector said, well, what about mandatory reporting? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he says, well, you're quoted in the New York Times this morning. I said, well, what did they say I said? And he said, well, you said it would have a chilling effect. And I said, well, I said, I don't think that was the words I used, but I wish I'd said it that articulately. <laughs> the fact is, you know, and it got laughs just like it did here from the press. And I said, it's like saying if you had mandatory reporting on the beltway around DC, and you said everybody had to report if they, spe if they were speeding, would that be an accurate report of speeding? Or if you said, how many speeding tickets do we have issued today? Is that many per speeding? Absolutely not. And just because you have a number doesn't tell you anything. And out of that, in fact, uh, our inspector went back and he was from Philadelphia and looked in Philadelphia County because they had mandatory reporting of cardiovascular mortality, you know, post op. Mm -hmm. And he looked for the previous three years, and in the whole Philadelphia, they had had three. Well, we know that's not true. <laughs> and, and finally, he and Senator Harkin realized that that was ridiculous. You know, to say <clears throat> mandatory reporting is ridiculous. I mean, that's the, that assumes mm -hmm. that it happens, which it doesn't. Right. All reporting is voluntary. So it's like, what is the data? How good is the data? How to use it? And I think you have to think seriously before you start, because what in a superficial way, it seems like it would be a good thing to do. It drives it underground. In fact, there's, there's many industries have evidence of that, and it's well, how do we use that data. Having said that, there's currently a lot of work going on on quality reporting. Mm -hmm. I, an, an article I saw recently estimates that physician practices spend more than $40,000 per physician. And if you multiply that out by the number of physicians, <laughs> you get to a number north of $15 billion. Mm -hmm. which is more than the entire budget of the Internal Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you a sense, uh, and this is just quality reports to CMS in the mandatory quality reporting programs, um, and not you know additional reports that go to private insurers and other regulatory bodies and so on. And so the question is, we're spending a lot of time, money, effort measuring something. And are we measuring the right thing, and are we using it in the right way? And I think, Jim, you, you sort of hit on that issue pretty nicely. Suboptimally, so. it's, uh, it's not, it has, there's room to improve. That's right, that's exactly system, right. Yeah. Is, I think, the way we should probably frame it. No, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think what's um, coming up in these clinician and hospital kinds of settings is this people and behavioral aspect is mm -hmm. really important, right? Now, there's all kinds of other data that has different kinds of issues that, that might not necessarily be the behavioral and, and reporting kinds of issues. And 
Uh, we are using some of that data, mm -hmm. you know, imaging data, for example, sure. um, and I think that there are others where we're still chasing the car, and in fact, both the dog and the car are on a moving train and also not standing <laughs> still. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I, I, I want to tie this back to your yeah. dogs and chat example, but I haven't <laughs> quite figured out how to do that. So. But I, I think the, you asked if we could actually chase up, or up, can we actually chase up to the data? I don't think we could ever do that because I think the, you know, there are new generation of EMR already, right? I mean, people are thinking about designing new EMR because the current ones are so not good to mm -hmm. use. So my feeling is that, like, I remember when I first started doing even the cancer case, the doctors always told us that we are always behind others because the medical community have devices, have systems and everything, and then we bring them, we give them the brain to use those systems. And that is, is really, in some sense, some truth. But uh, on the other hand, I think that is the idea, right? It's evolving. So the challenges will always be there, but that we are there to actually give them the technology so that they could evolve with us and, and we provide them with the capability to do better, I think. Can I turn it to the audience? Any questions for our panelists? Yes, sir. It's often said that the most important part of any OR study is um, defining the problem that you're working on. Uh, to what extent uh, does existing data help you do this? And can big data help you even even more? Oh well, I mean, cer certainly. I mean, you know, one example I gave before was. It was, well, and this is a very simple thing, and it's not a really sophisticated OR thing, but in bringing together the various forms of information that already exist, you know, whether it's in the written record or the typed in record, the free text, if you will, versus actual real-time lab value, you know, what you're taking right now versus historical data. Uh, we could show that you could inform the practitioner at the point of care, not afterwards and say, oh, let's critique mm -hmm. the case, you could have done better. We show, for example, you know, if, you, um, if you're ventilating a patient, right, and you're, you're breathing for them. Uh, you want to have about seven cc's per kilogram of lean body mass. Well, first of all, you know, we're not too lean in the United States. So if you look at, the, <laughs> if you look at, you know, the, the you know, level of obesity, and it's not strictly for obese, you know, people would be overventilated. That turns out that has a big impact on mortality, okay? So here's something that's very easy to get a handle on pretty quickly and tell the person linked into their ventilator, comes up and says, wow, this person's being ventilated with 50% more than you should. And they did, and we could look in our data, looking at the at the practitioners, that within one quarter, virtually everybody was ventilating at the right level, where virtually almost nobody was before. Yeah. And it wasn't because people wanted to not ventilate them correctly. It was the fact that the information wasn't available at the at the nexus where they're caring for the patient. Mm -hmm. So they believed they were doing okay, but they really mm -hmm. weren't, right? So this is not a malicious act, a malevolent act. It's the fact that the data was available somewhere, but not for them. So instead of just telling everybody, well, make sure you're given seven cc's per kilogram of lean body mass, we could say it till you're blue in the face, but they don't know what the patient's lean body mass was. You know, they have to calculate it out. You know, was that available to them right then? Did they know in the, in the, in the heat of battle when they're doing things and they're readjusting it? The answer is no, not always, right? So by making it available in a very short period of time, you went from many weren't doing it to virtually everybody was doing it in the areas where it was available. I would say probably today, I don't know this, but I bet if we would go out and we would look around, it's probably not being done a lot of places, even today, where it's well known, but not used. In fact, one thing I would say, there's very few studies been done on this, and the ones were back around 2000, 2001, but from the time that a, uh, there was like level one, high level uh, confidence in data that came out, it was published in one of the two or three top frontline journals you know, in, in healthcare. Before how many, and I'll even give, I'll give this punch on it, but how many years before 50% of physicians are doing that? 17. Mm -hmm. yeah. 17 years. And I wrote an invited article in graduate medication. I said, but why is that? How do we get that information out there? When a new Apple, you know, iPhone comes out, it doesn't take 17 years for a physician to want to buy it. Right? They're probably sending their assistant down to wait in line at the Apple store. Or when CMS sends out a thing that says for conditions of participation, if you want to be paid, you have to report your quality data, however yeah. good or bad that is. Right. By next month, you won't get paid. You know what? They managed to figure that out. But yet with things like this that are somewhat very concrete with huge difference, it's many years. I mean, I'd say many, 17 years. Some might say it's only 15. But, you know, I mean, we're not saying it's a year. You know, it's not a year. It's certainly not that. You know, it's many years. So why is that? I think part of it is how do we get the data? How do we show them 
that it does apply to them. What you'll always see is they'll say, well, that's not us. You know, I've been doing this for years with, with hundreds of hospitals, you know, around the world, not just here. And they'll say, well, we're not like them. And then you look at her dating and go, you know what, you're almost exactly like that. <laughs> and, and you go around and then, you, ha you know, and, and usually it's until they, it gets, they get their, they have their epiphany. And often it's a bad event. You know, either they're ridiculed in the press or they have a patient death that, you know, is thought to be, you know, if they were using what was commonly known other places. And then they get religion. Well, that's a really stupid way to learn. That, you know, we have to learn from everybody, not from other people's experience or from data that exists. When I hurt my own patient and know that I have, then maybe I'll change. That's nuts. You and know, I, and I think as we have this data, we're able to show, you know, and it's a matter of communication. You have to get past egos. That's not how we did it, to show the data is real. There are things that come out that we look in data and we really understand how it applies and it gets misapplied. And it can have one of those and people say, oh, well, this one that I don't like must be like that one. So I'm not going to listen to you. So how do we communicate that data? I think it's a challenge. I mean, you're dealing with people. But I'd like to add to that because we have like the, the, the opportunity to actually look at like over 800 hospitals and looking at chronic disease. And I think diabetics and, and it is a very good example is that we look at if a patient has these symptoms, what is happening to all these sites and what are the practice variations and what is the best practice and what is the best outcome. So the data across is what you can see the evidence, right? Without that, if you cannot access to it, you cannot see the evidence. And if you are able to see hundreds of hospitals instead of just your own hospital, you learn from it. You know, one thing that I find it very interesting is that, uh, not so much about ego, is that if you say, here's the evidence of the work, and, and then you don't show them how they perform, but you put all the dots on it and ask them, where do you think the oh, dots yeah. are? That's beautiful. <laughs> they always get it wrong. Like, they don't know oh, which yeah. dot. But then they also are very competitive. I mean, that's, I think that's the beauty is that when they say, oh, this guy actually do really well. So they, they basically, the collaborative competition is exactly what makes them really do better. So I think the data not only really say, I give you the evidence, the data also make them more competitive so that they feel like, okay, if you can do it, and I must be able to do it too, right? So I think that is really a nice part of it. And, and, and like I said, I think we, we are in a very good condition is that we don't have these polls true, right? I mean, the evidence that come out from the uh, medical record and we look at the data, these are evidence and they are real evidence and, and relying on the real patients. And so this type of data is really invaluable. And having those access, I think, give us a lot more power in terms of changing the way people are really providers, like treating the patients, as well as changing the patients, how they behave. And I think that's really great for us. I think Eva's exactly right in this, the thing I gave with the ventilator, the example, that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. All the practitioners could, you know, we just had like a Pareto <laughs> chart, and all we could show them, they, we could know who everybody was, yeah, but the yeah. practitioner, when they would sign and it's look wonderful. at it, they would show where they are. Yeah. And they, you know, they, you know, they thought they were giants among practitioners, and they'd see, <laughs> oh, where am I? And they'd yeah. say, oh, I'm in the bad boy list, right? <laughs> and, and within yeah, one quarter, really virtually everybody was, was down where you wanted yeah. them to be, without doing anything, without, you know, having to talk to anybody, without, they mm -hmm. just looked and they go, wow. You know, because mm -hmm. they're all legends in their own mind, you know, yeah. and they realize that maybe it's not quite true. So I think it's hugely <laughs> important. It's a change yeah. management issue. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, my name's Santiago and I work for Senator Heitkamp covering health. Um, and basically, the frame the problem, maternal mortality right now is just skyrocketed. And at the same time, you're sort of looking at obstetric centers especially in rural areas closing. Um, so m my boss really cares about this issue and is really trying to figure out what we need to be doing to reverse those trends. And um, we don't think necessarily we need to be opening up more obstetric centers in rural areas where there's one birth every six months, right? But basically um, trying to think about what data collection policy should look like, um, what is the best thing for the actual policy, what should CDC be collecting? How should we be um, trying to do that to, so that you guys can actually use this data to help figure out this problem? Because right now, especially with this issue, is that um, mothers will will die, and it's during their mm -hmm. it's either pre or postpartum or postpartum but it's never con actually connected to their pregnancy. So mm -hmm. on their death records, it never actually shows that they were pregnant when this happens. It's because 
during a C-section, they doctor accidentally cut something, and so it's due to they died due to internal bleeding, not, and it was never connected to pregnancy. So basically, um, you guys are talking about a lot of these things, but what should a data collection policy actually look like as we're moving forward, um, trying to solve a lot of the problems here? So can I, I can touch on this one a little bit. I've done some work around pregnant mothers, and my colleague has also done some work around maternal mortality. So one thing is to start with data that we do have, not just data from the, the death certificate, but you know one can look at Medicaid data historically and look both at mortality and what kind of care they were getting during their pregnancy for that population. And in Georgia, for example, 40% of the births are covered under Medicaid. And so that's a huge portion of, of the population. And of course, we know that the lower income uh, are more at risk for various um, reasons. And I think looking also at private insurance companies and combining you know, what you might be able to learn from that kind of data would also help uh, it, you know, complement the data that you can get from other kinds of systems. Now, the Medicaid data right now, when you purchase it, like when a university purchase it, it purchases it, you're getting older data, but you can get data that's more real time directly from states, but even the CDC it has a delay in how they're getting that data. But you can work, one can work with states to get access to that data more quickly to, to look at these kinds of things. Then one may also want to explore various kinds of options. Uh, you know, even in some other countries, they're finding that other types of providers, not only physicians, um, but midwives, uh, nurses, mid-level staffing providers, are able to provide some kinds of care that can enable you to reach populations that are further away where that last mile, that rural element is, is, um, is important. And so looking at various kinds of strategies and whether any of those might, uh, might help. So I think, I think the, what Julie mentioned is really the key is that you have to use multi different type of sources. So we have actually, uh, since we talk about newborn babies, so we actually really deal with exactly the mother. And, and I think those type of data will not, it is really difficult to collect those data. But then I discovered that it is the best way to do it is really getting all the data from the medical record and the claim data and everything combined. Because the reason why the claim data is important because every single procedure <laughs> that is done on the individual is recorded. Those data is really important. So we have access to those, for example, Kaiser data. We pull out some of those pregnant women and we, have, we were able to map out their condition to their deaths. And we were also able to predict who are at risk. So, and that's really what you would like to see. And I don't believe that you can see just one type of data. You really have to use all of them. And CDC, unfortunately, would not have those such type of grand, like such type of microscopic data. And you will have to use all of those data, I think, for this type of population. But my feeling is that it can be done because like, Kaiser is very, very responsive. In fact, we have access to all their database, which is quite amazing because even with the database, you still cannot pull out the data. But once you pull those out, then you see a lot of things that you cannot see in the death claim and everything. Other questions? Well, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everybody in the audience. Uh, I'm sure everyone would be more than happy to have discussions offline with anybody who would like. Uh, so thanks for, for coming, everyone.